All right, you all have uh, questions to lay on me? Huh? How do you make a set? Uh, you say you want a set. You give it a type. <clears throat> you want a set of anything in particular? What do you want to call it? Exceptions. Uh, when do you have to make an iterator like this versus like what you can do with a vector creating an in integer index? Generally the vector ends up being kind of the exception because it is well ordered and therefore uh, you can pick out any item based on its order in the container more frequently. Um, Either one of two things, either it isn't well ordered or it's not contiguous. So the reason vector, let, let me back up, the, the square braces and having an integer index in there, that is a, a referencing mechanism that's peculiar to arrays, right? So the vector is paying allegiance to the array type that we all know and love way back from when C was first formed. Um, and it works for vector, at least in part, because uh, internally in its structure it is storing things as arrays. So uh, there, it's, it's easy to do simple math on it. And again, that's done internally to the, the compiler. But if I have, if I have a, an integer pointer x, and I say, again, this is very naughty code because I haven't initialized X and I'm trying to get at it. But this is going to have some location, like in my little diagram, it's always 100. Uh, then what it does is it takes 100. It would be the address. I should put it down here. This would be the address, say 100, plus five times the size of an integer. And that's the math that's happening internally to allow that to happen. And the reason that works is because everything is contiguous. If they weren't contiguous in memory, meaning not right next to each other, then this formula wouldn't work at all, right? And so vector ends up being peculiar in that it has these characteristics. Generally, containers and lists uh, don't have this kind of setup. So really this way of iterating through items is more the rule than the exception. The vectors is kind of the exception. And if we and as an instructor we like showing arrays and vectors first because they're easier to understand than uh, this kind of bloated way of iterating through a container. Delete that stuff. All right, so if I've done all my coding correctly here, I create the set. Then I fill the set. I guess I should probably, let me change the style of my comment.
Okay, let's see if that works. So one thing to note is I inserted these into the set in the order 5, 20, 15, negative 3, but you can see that that's in a completely different order. So this is just going to show you that you cannot know the order of things inside of a set. It, it, it is uh, the analogy, but being just a bag full of stuff is pretty apt in this case, and that illustrates it. Other questions? Mm -hmm. What would you do in the add exception, add exception function inside of employee? What would I do in the with the add exception function inside of employee? Basically, that line of code there, except I wouldn't hard code fifteen. I would instead of fifteen, I would have the exception that was passed to the function. It's just a one liner. Other questions? Yes? Can you go over more of um, how you compare the, when you go through the, uh, the exception being compared to uh, the, yeah, the, 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 you're comparing the exceptions to the exception. You're, you're, right, so you, meaning the exceptions.txt, how you go about determining which employee gets that exception. Let's call this matching. So you open, I don't know why I have this as a comment. Open up. Exceptions.txt. In a loop. Read in a, an employee ID. And, and what is it, an inventory ID? After you've read them in. So you have your employee ID, and then where are all your employees? In the They're in a vector, right? So if I did a role play and I had everyone in this room stand up and stand in a line just like that vector, and I had to find out which one of you had a student ID that ended in 3334, how would I do that as just a human? Except, except the limit is I can only talk to one person at a time. Ask each one in the loop and then find the right one. Right. I would, I would create a loop, and I would, if you will, to use programming terminology, and I'd basically start at the first person and say, is your ID 3334? No. Then I'd go to the second person, and ask, I would ask that same question until I found a match. All right. So that's what you do. Loop through. Uh, in a loop, uh, reading in the file. This is in a loop. Well, I don't want to write it that way. Um, how about this? Read file in a loop. And then this is, uh, I don't know, go through employees in a go through the employee vector in a loop. So this is another loop. And so ask the question, is this your ID? Now, how, based on the functions that you're being asked to write,
based on the questions, excuse me, based on the member functions that you're being asked to write, how do I go about asking an employee if this is his or her ID? This is the employee ID right here. I'm going to butt them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Use the get ID function, right? So if I want to make it more faithful to my little role play example here, if I want to make it more faithful to how it actually occurs in code, I would go up to each person and I would say, give me your ID. And this person gives me their ID. And now I compare that to 3334 to see if they're the same. And if they aren't, I go to the next person. Give me your ID. I get the ID and I do the comparison, right? So that's what's being done in the code here. If the answer is yes or true, then ask that employee to add exception. Which exception? This one right here, right? Oops, this should be in a loop, so I should indent that. That makes sense. So in the set we're only just having, um, we're not going to have the ID of uh, the distributed comparison and adding the the inventory. Yeah, because the exception set is just part of the uh, that employee. So like they're just going to have a list of the exceptions and tools they can use. And that's it. Right. Yeah. So so to to keep my <coughs> analogy going, every single person standing at the front of this room is holding a, a shopping bag. Right, and if I find a match, then I'm going to give them a number. They're going to throw it in their shopping bag. So some employees will have nothing in their bag. Some will have several numbers in their bag. Some will just have one in their bag. Other questions? Doesn't have to be about the project. It can be about anything at all. Are we, is that really due the first, the next assignment? Did I say the next assignment's due on the first? That's what I thought. All right, yeah. So that, so I'll talk about that since that's kind of next on my list here. Let me, let me go back to assignments and get into, whoops, that is not what I wanted. We'll make that real, yeah, it is what I wanted. I was just a little bit shocked on how the word Chico there was taking over the world. Um, all right, that's a little bit too much fun. Let's. So we are. And I need. You know what I need? I need to go to student view. Oh, come on. There. All right, so there are a couple more things posted. Um, this is the one we're finishing, yeah? Or finished. Then we have, a, we have two more assignments here that will do it for the assignments this semester. Let me start with assignment 12. Okay. Uh, assignment, sorry, I was making triple sure that I was recording. Assignment 12, that, so, uh, when you become a senior here, you, you take the capstone course, which is just a projects course. You select a project 
uh, generally of your own choosing, and you spend the semester implementing it. And I probably said it at one point in the semester. Around the, the halls here, you see these, I don't know what they are, two by three foot posters. And those are all projects that seniors have done. So part of the requirement of doing a project is that you have to do a poster presentation. So near the end of the semester, you have to create a poster on what your project is. And then at the poster session, you have to, the, the person who created the poster has to wait for people to come by and they explain what their project is to any who are interested. And they generally will have their computer there and demonstrate it. Or if they're doing a mobile thing, they'll have a mobile device there. Um, so an assignment that I have for my 111 students is for you to attend this session this poster session, and I ask you to pick out three of the posters. They're pro I don't know what the exact count is. There are probably 15 to 20 students in the class. You just need to pick out three of them and just ask you to write who the person is, what the project is, um, a summary of the project, not a lot, just a few sentences. Uh, find out what the programming language is that the project is written in, do a little web search afterward and, and just in one or two sentences describe what the programming language is that they use. Uh, and then you're asked to do it on three of them. So I ask you to rank um, what you like best and what you like least uh, as far as the three projects go. So I don't think it's too difficult to, to do this. The, my motivation as an instructor for doing this is that it exposes you to how far you will progress in the program and how wide and expansive the field actually is. So right now you you can get in kind of a blinders mindset that you know you're going to end up being able to write all these great text applications that ask you questions and that you answer and it sorts numbers and blah 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 but actually eventually as you get more and more of this knowledge now you begin to apply it in a, a quite a diverse set of technologies and it is surprising at how diverse the projects are that students uh, pick. I've had a student who's done um, remote control software so running light dimmers and stuff, a program to control that around the house, uh, a lot of mobile stuff, um, music applications, it, it just runs the gamut. It's, it, it's generally a fairly interesting thing just to peruse these poster sessions. Uh, it is this next Tuesday from 2 to 4.30 p.m. The location I'm finding out, I think it's probably going to be in Calusa Hall, that kind of meeting room building there next to, uh, what is it, Creekside Cafe, that little coffee place there across the creek from Holt Hall. Um, and the only caveat is what I haven't read here is that uh, historically computer science has done this as a little separate activity, but this semester the entire college is doing this. So every every department generally has a capstone project. So there'll be civil engineers and uh, mechatronics and so on and so forth doing their presentations as well. I do not have any idea what the layout will be. I don't know if they're all going to be mixed or separated, but I want you to make sure that uh, when the person's showing up their toothpick bridge that you realize they're probably not a computer science student, right? So definitely make sure you're looking at uh, computer science or computer information systems students for their projects. So that's, that's the easy assignment. That happens on Tuesday. Uh, my recommendation is you just knock that out. You go to this thing and then that evening you go home, spend half an hour on the web looking up the programming languages, turn it in and you're done. Uh, however, that said, I did make the due date like the Sunday night following, like the 11th, something like that. Um, so, assuming that you've got a lot going on, you do have the weekend to work on that. The more challenging project is assignment, assignment 11, Cylon says what? Uh, this comes from my previous TA who has since graduated. Um, and I, I'm not going to read it to you, I'll let you read it, but basically what it is is it's text processing. The context is that you receive a coded message and you have to run it through a number of steps to decode it, so you have to find all the letters A and change them to X, and then you have to find uh, anything that's uppercase and make it lowercase. There's a combination of, of steps you go through, and in the end it turns this coded message 
into a message that is, um, I don't want to say Battlestar Galactians. What are they called? Who are the who Adama and the bunch? Not the the good guys. What are the good guys called? They're what planet they come from? You didn't watch this show, but me. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like we're we're humans, or maybe we're Americans, right? I don't know what to call these people. They're Galactians, Battlestar Galactians. I don't I don't know. Doesn't matter. All right. Um, so yeah, so that's the assignment to do, and you were worried about the due date for that? Yeah, I, I can, I think this is a mistake. Huh? Make them both at the same day, the 11th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not, I'm not married to this, so I can make that later. Uh, there's a warning though that um, I have Project Four as well, right? So there's both this assignment and this project that are going to be overlapping. Um, but I think I'm, I'm thinking that Project Four you'll find not as difficult as Project Three because it is simply adding on to Project Three. So assuming you have a working Project Three, Project Four should be pretty straightforward. You're going to add an equipment class. Um, you're going to have, do a little sorting and you know, not a lot to Project Four. I think Project Four is a nice way to get your grade beefed up there. Um, so yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll push back this due date. Give you more time on that. Uh, I, I will tell you that uh, I'm sure I'll get questions as we we get into the assignment here. You'll note that what this thing says over and over again is you must not use any loops in this function. You'll see that over and over again. Um, and the reason this is in there is because a large part of this project is to drive you to the standard template library. So one of the things that there are in the standard template library are algorithms that will do things for you. And the idea is don't write a loop and do this by hand. Find the right algorithm in the standard template library and there's just one function call and bam, it's done for you. Okay, that's the intent of this statement all over the place. Uh, but it is it is confusing because there are actually a couple places where you do need loops. For instance, uh, you have to open up files and read in files. And when you read in a file, there's really no way to get around a loop for that. Uh, so there is a clarification here near the bottom. I've got it bracketed off by these horizontal lines. Here's a message I copied from last semester, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I paste this here, and this is just a little more explanation on what it means by no loops. So. The moral to this whole diatribe that I'm giving you is simply read through the entire thing, walk away from it for half an hour, or if you're a last minute person, five days, come back to it, read the whole thing again, right? Don't just read three paragraphs of it and then not know what to do. All right, any questions on that? Nice thing is that you're allowed to use fake swear words in assignments. So. Fracking. The Battlestar Galactians have foul, fake, curse word mouths. I'm not sure if that was a sentence that worked. I did in my head. All right. So, moving on. Yes? How do you tell if you're at exceptions? That's an excellent question. How do you tell if your add exceptions function works? So I mentioned one thing you want to do that you can do. Uh, and in fact, there was one student who had done this earlier this morning that I ran into and worked with a little bit on it, is create a sanity check function. Uh, and I would create an employee, colon, colon, sanity check. And I would have that sanity check function first print out the person's name, the employee's name, and then loop through, you, you know, crib the code that I typed a little bit earlier for looping through the exceptions in your sanity check function, copy that loop in there and print out each of the exceptions in that employee's set. 
And then in main, either before or after your assignments report function, just put um, I guess you'd need a sanity check function for depot as well. So you'd have a depot sanity check function that would merely loop through employees calling each employee sanity check. And then uh, so in the main you say d, d dot sanity check and you should get a list of employees and their exceptions. Uh, and and the, that is just a debugging tool, right? What you do is you either comment out all the code. You don't have to comment it all out, but at least comment, comment out where it's called in main once you have everything working. Um, but uh, as a software engineer, your practice will be rife with that kind of stuff. All the time people are creating bits of debugging code just to make sure things are working and then they get removed from the final version. Other questions? Okay. So I'll talk about a topic that I hadn't covered explicitly, but I think is good to know prior to you getting into 2.11. <clears throat> oh, and in fact, I think what I'll do now, I'll mix it up a little bit rather than having the word of the day right at the very end. Why don't I just do it right now? <clears throat> and this has a, a very special... Uh, Another, it, all these arcade games are close to my heart, but this one, this one will have a little bit of a ironic uh, significance to you as well, because this particular arcade game from 1982 is Joust. No, the paging's off a little bit. Hang on. So. As you would, uh, uh, what comes to every mind, one's mind with Joust is a knight flying on an ostrich, fighting knights, riding buzzards. So that is the fever dream that was 1980s arcade action right there. Flying ostrich and buzzards. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> That's right. They threw some random pixels out there, and then they brought a four-year-old in and said, what does that look like to you? You know, ostrich. Okay, there you go. Let's build it as that, right? And that's pretty much how it works, because if you look at, if you look at a lot of the graphics, if you took portions of arcade games from the 1980s, out of context, you know, you just took a little screenshot of one little icon and showed it to someone. You wouldn't have any idea what that thing is. Could be a rock, could be a person, could be a bird. Um, that's how bad the graphics were then. But, you know, you say it's joust and you say it's ostriches and you use your imagination and that's exactly what it looks like. The Rorsarsh Roar ink blot interpreting, whatever the pronunciation is. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to introduce to you are something called references. And this is a construct that is unique to C++ and does not exist in the C world. So I'm going to go back to an example I would have used... sometime in the past. Oops, make that void. Here's main, 
I create an integer called value, assign two to it. I print it out just so that we can see what it's doing. I'm going to call this function add five. And when I do that, my value, which has two in it, is going to be copied into num. I'm going to add five to num. I'm going to print out num. And then after I return from that function, I'm going to print out value once more. Uh, and so I quickly whip for my utility belt my sketching thingy. Okay, I've done this version of this drawing a few times. I'll do it one more time. Get our memory going here. We'll save it under a different name. We'll call this references. Okay. So, uh, line 11, create an integer called value. It has two. Call this function. This function creates an integer called num. Let me do it right here. and the two is copied in. Then in the function, I add five to it, so this two becomes a seven. I print it out, so it should print out two, it should print out seven, and then I return from the function. When I return from the function, num goes out of scope, so this is, this is released. And then it prints out the original value, which is 2. So we should see 272. And we do. So references. All I have to do in this entire program is to put something right after the word int. put a notation immediately after the type, in this case, int, to uh, specify that num is a reference to an existing variable, not its own variable. And the one thing that's confusing about the notation they choose, it'd be nice if they did something like, I don't know, if there's like reference to say that int was an integer reference, that would be great. Uh, they don't. They chose something in the language that is already used for something else, and that's what makes it frustrating. They chose that character. So in this context, that character, the ampersand, means that num is a reference to an existing variable. It is not its own variable. So by changing that one character by adding that one character, if I compile and run my program again, you will note that value is now 7. Now to look at that pictorially, what's happening, I'll do the exact same thing except I'll change to this blue color here, is I created a variable 
called value, and it started with number two in it. Then we call the function right here, where value comes in here, but num is what I would call an integer reference. So the way I would draw that pictorially is I would say that num is just another name for the same chunk of memory. Now, anything I do to num in here, I'm actually doing to value. So this ends up changing to a seven. Okay, and that is what a reference is. Any questions on that? Now let me do something very, very different. I'm going to create a float fl, and I'm going to make that 3.14. Note that I'm using the ampersand there, but this is very, very, very different, entirely different, and that's what's frustrating for me as an instructor is to have to explain that even though these characters are identical, they're being used totally differently, and they mean different things. So what does line 20 mean? Line 20 means that I want to take the address of FL, right? So on line 19, I create FL. So looking at my drawing again, if I create FL, I guess I should choose an even different color. If I create FL and I assign 3.14 to it, if I put an ampersand in front of FL, what this expression will return is it will return the address of where FL starts, which is 116. And we can see that if I print this out, like I put it in a C out statement. There is the very last line, so this messiness is where FL is inside of my computer when the program's running. And incidentally, I've tried to drive this home before, but just to show you that you will note, here we have 177, here we have 64A, or 177A, E64A. So every time I run this program, FL's sitting in an entirely different location here at 68, so on and so forth. And that's just showing that I'm just driving home that when you run a program and these numbers aren't deterministically always put in the same place, it just happens to be where memory is available at that moment in time when you're running the program. Questions? Mm -hmm. in what thing? In what thing? So I, I, I in the integers two integers. Oh yeah, sure. So I can create int Bobby equals ninety nine. So the question is, what is num referring to? Yeah. Num is referring to uh, whichever variable I use when I call the function. So here I'm calling the function. If I put Bobby in here, it would num would be referencing Bobby instead of value. Yeah, it all depends on how you're using it, right? Okay. 
Um, any other questions on that? How can you, uh, a, a general question you can ask yourself while you're getting familiar with this and you see an ampersand and you get confused, well, is it talking about taking the address of something like on line 21 or is it about num being a reference to a variable? One way, again, to tell these apart, and this goes for the asterisk as well, is the difference between, if you think of usage in a sentence, the difference between noun and verb. On line 7, that's a noun. This is describing the kind of thing that num is. So if you see an ampersand in the context of describing the type of something, then that's a noun and that's a reference. Num is an integer reference. If you see it in an expression, like on the C out on line 21, that is taking an action. That is a verb. It is the action of getting the address of FL. So we have five minutes left. Uh, this is what I want to do. I want you to take three, no, I have four minutes left. Well, no, I'm going by this. I have five minutes left, somewhat less than five minutes. I want uh, you all to get into small groups, and for three minutes, I want you to write a version of this function that uses pointers, not references. So the old, quote, C-style way of doing it. How, and what you need to do is you need to figure out how does this line change, how does this line change, how does this line change, and how do those lines change. So just two to three minutes. Just see if you can figure out how to do it with pointers. <clears throat> And do you understand why I'm asking this? Because prior to knowing about, let me rephrase what I'm asking you to do just slightly. Let's pretend that you want to do the exact same thing. You want a function that is called add5 that will change the thing coming in, just like this reference is, meaning it's changing value in main. You want to change value in main, but you're not allowed to, via add5, but you're not allowed to use references. Let's say you're using the C language and you have to do it with pointers. How can you use addresses and pointers such that if you call in add 5 and pass in some form of value, the value actually gets changed from 2 to 7. Uh, 
Okay, ideally I'd be able to give you 10 minutes to do this, but we're at the end of class, so I, I just wanted you to start thinking about how to do it. Let me say how you would do it. I'm going to, what's this called? References. I'm going to call it pointers.cpp. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in the address of value. So coming back to my drawing, the address of value, I guess I'll use this purple stuff, the address of value is 100, right? So 100 is what is getting passed into the function. I have to come up here. What kind of thing is 100? The address of? The address of value, but what kind of thing is value? So the, uh, the kind of thing going into the function is the address of an integer or an integer pointer, right? So this thing is called an integer pointer. Now num is its own variable, but it holds 100, yeah? So num holds 100. Now, how, what do I, I don't want to add 5 to 100. I want to add 5 to whatever is inside of 100, which is 2. So I add 5 to 2, that becomes 7. And then finally here, I said you have to change this line. What this is going to print out is this is going to print out the address, which is 100. We want the contents at that address, which will be 7. And so this is how you do the exact same thing with pointers. Why and when would you want to use the reference over pointer? Uh, when would you want to use one over the other? Uh, I would say with pointers, so even though pointers is, quote, the old way, it is definitely not the outdated way. We've seen that when you allocate memory dynamically at runtime, you get a pointer back using new. And that, and you're using you're using dynamic memory all over the place in a normal application. So you're constantly using pointers to pass things around. So uh, that is why this is alive and well. I'll, so I'll say one example of using a where you'd want to use a pointer is because um, you're dealing with dynamic memory. The uh, an example of when you would want to use a reference is maybe you want to change a bunch of things inside the function. So how about this for a function? And uh, void swap. And what I want to do is I want to swap one and two. So what I'd do is I'd create an integer temp is equal to one. Uh, one is equal to two. Two is equal to one. And what I'm doing is I'm swapping the two values. Two is equal. Excuse me. Two is equal to temp. Thank you. Right. So if, if this one, if this, if this number contains 99 and this one contains 33, then what happens is I'm assigning 33 to temp. So now this contains 33. Now whatever's in two, I'm assigning to one. So now one contains 30. Wait a minute. 99. This is the one I got wrong. All right, I'm getting there. Temp has 99. Whatever's in 2, I'm assigning to 1. That makes that 33. Now whatever's in temp, I'm assigning to 2. That's 99. So you see I've swapped the two values. But if I do it by pass by value, what I'm doing is I'm changing 1 and 2, which are their own variables. And when I call this function down here and I want to swap the value, uh, value in Bobby, it isn't going to do anything at all. However, if I make them references, now, Bobby and value actually get changed. So there's an example of a nice slick way of why I might want to use a reference. Where I could do it with pointers, but it'd be cumbersome to do it with pointers. And it's a lot nicer to read this as someone going through code than it is to read, if you're doing pointers, to read something like that. So there's an example of where you'd want to use references instead. All right, with that, have a wonderful weekend. Read through the assignment. Uh, take some initial stabs at it. Bring questions on Monday. I will also get Project 4's write-up posted over the weekend. So if and when you see that, look at that as well.